Hello all sentient beings and welcome to Transmissions Alt Mode where we talk about all news, comics, and media related to the... On this episode of Transmissions Alt Mode, we pick up a lot of G1 and IDW Easter eggs in our review of the Transformers Cyberverse cartoon. We've got more teaser images from the upcoming Ghostbusters Transformers crossover, and producer Lorenzo de Bonaventura has, wait for it, plans for the upcoming Transformers live-action movies. Today is Friday, March 22nd, 2019, and this is episode 121 of Transmissions Alt Mode. Welcome to Transmissions Alt Mode, the podcast that would gladly trade a The Last Night sequel for a Beast Wars movie. I'm your host, Charles, a.k.a. Big C, and I'm joined by the excellent Transmissions team. Jeremy, a.k.a. Yakko. Hello. I have thoughts. Just wait till media news. And Daryl, the Cybertronian Beast. I, too, have opinions. We will have a discussion. Let's talk Transformers. All right. (laughs) I hope that's not any different from all our other podcasts. (laughs) Where we have <laughs> thoughts and opinions and discussions, but <laughs> every other well, I... podcast leading up to this one has been scripted. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, again, uh, if you listen to the Toy Show, uh, you probably have uh, you have already heard us talk about this, but I will throw it again to Jeremy to bring us in with the sad news before we move on with the rest of the show. Yeah, um, we had the news that Beast Wars writer Larry Dottilio had passed away. He worked on Beast Wars, um, something I didn't realize until I went through his uh, TF Wiki page. He also did the episode Predacons Rising and Transformers Animated, but he did so much more than Transformers stuff. He did He-Man, She-Ra, um, Babylon 5. He, I mean... He worked on so many things in between, and it it's just some of the best episodes of Beast Wars, I think, are, are to his credit. So um, he's going to be missed, and, yeah, it's, it's a, a big loss for the community. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know. It's it's kind of a... It's a young age, too. I mean, I know it's he had, he had an illness, so it's not... Uh, these things happen, so it's yeah. just kind of sad. But uh, yeah, we thank uh, we thank him for all the the work he put into the Transformers franchise. Like I, I think I, I said it already on the Toy Show that Beast Wars really was a was a big resurgence of Transformers and and brought Transformers back into the forefront. So mm-hmm. you know, at the time when Beast Wars came out, Transformers was considered a kind of a dead franchise. So. Yeah, I mean, Beast Wars really brought it back. And then, you know, credit to him and Bob Ford for being accepting of the fandom and that the fandom's influences are what really brought a lot of the G1 connections into Beast Wars, which made it, in my opinion, a much better show. Yep, definitely. All right, well, uh, let's get back to some high energy and get back into the rest of talking about Transformers. So, uh, as always, we start off every show by thanking our Donatrions, those beautiful people who support us on Patreon and PayPal. So thank you to everyone who does that. Uh, if you would like to join those ranks, just go to transmissionspodcast.com slash support. And there you can find links to join us on Patreon and PayPal. Uh, if you don't want to do that, you can still support us by buying merchandise uh, from our T public store at transmissionspodcast.com slash shop. Uh, there you can find some t-shirt designs from us. And we just recently have a new design from friend of the show, K girl who designed our transmissions logo. And she also has uh, so designed some other transmissions shirts for us. Uh, you can get her shirt from our store or you can go directly to her store on T public and uh, we will have a link. What's it called? <laughs> you know, Daryl. <laughs> yes, I do. T public.com slash user slash superstar K superstar K. So we will have a link in the show notes so you can go straight there. Uh, but yeah, you can get shirts from go shirt get shirts from her store or get shirts from our store. So support everyone. All right, so let's uh, 
start off with talking about some comics news. All right. So uh, we have some news about the next uh, IDW uh, big volume uh, collection, IDW collection phase two, volume 10. This is coming in December of 2019. This is going to collect issues 44 and 45 of Transformers, 45 to 49 of More Than Meets the Eye, 6 to 7 of Windblade, and the Sins of the Wreckers miniseries, uh, the Combiners, the Combiner Hunters one shot, and the Holiday Special. Uh, so, a bit of a bit of a kind of a mix of stuff. The uh, the cover features Victorian there, so uh, you can see that cover image linked uh, uh, from the Amazon listing. Not sure who the artist is on that cover, but uh, I'm. Sh- I think it might be Sarah. Okay. Um, I'm not sure. I think I just remember seeing somewhere it was. Mm-hmm. Amazon might know. But yeah, so if uh, if you're collecting the, the trades, they're they're still pushing them out. I think they're going to try and go through the all the uh, uh, up to the end of the previous continuity. I, I wonder if when they get to Revolution, that'll be Phase Three. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, I was about to say, is this going? If is the the new series Phase Three or Phase Four? Yeah, I don't know. We should ask John Barber if. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Uh, next, uh, we've got more preview images from the Transformers Ghostbusters crossover. Uh, we've got uh, some art showing off Ghost, but the um, Gozer meeting uh, Megatron and the Decepticon. So uh, you can see uh, the you know, Megatron strides forward. One of the terror, the robotic terror dogs goes to attack Megatron. Megatron just swats him away like casually and walks right up to Gozer face to face. He does not look. <laughs> then we see uh, looks like she she similar to the 1984 Ghostbusters movie where she asks them to pick the form of their destroyer. Uh, I guess. uh Starscream. It looks like Starscream picks, and he imagines himself <laughs> a giant Starscream with a crown, with the heads of Megatron, Shockwave, Optimus Prime, and Jetfire <laughs> draped around him, and the, holding a Matrix too. So that's interesting. I, I want. I want. That's either that's either Megatron's worst fear or Starscream's uh, greatest desire. <laughs> Uh, then another cover image, I think, is the, the Ghostbusters um, facing off against a bunch of Kremzeeks and Starscream's ghost. Starscream's ghost leading a bunch of Kremzeeks, which is cool. I'm really liking the art in this. It's, you know, for for artists that, you know, coming from the Ghostbusters side, they're really getting, you know, the look of the Transformers are, are spot yeah, on. Yeah, definitely. So maybe you guys want to want to migrate over to some Transformers art. For you know, moon moonlighting. Yeah, I love that the inside of Gozer's temple thing. There is the kind of trippy look from the the opening credits of the Transformers movie. Oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> All right, uh, and next we have a uh, an exclusive cover for Transformers number one at WonderCon. Uh, so uh, this is art by EJ Sue. Oh yeah, that's right, EJ Sue. Good old EJ Sue from the well known from the the first IDW Transformers art series. So this one features uh, Megatron, Orion Pax, and Chromia. Uh, and yeah, so if you're going to WonderCon, you can pick this up. And this is uh, going to be ten dollars at WonderCon. And it's uh, so that's I think WonderCon's coming up at the end of March. So it's enjoy. not bad looking either. Yeah, it's a it's a nice cover. And uh, I think we talked last week about some Transformers panels at WonderCon. Yes, didn't? we did. So um, I, could, <laughs> I saw my camera, but we actually talked about it. But if you are going to be at WonderCon and you can go to those panels, please get in touch with us. We'd like to uh, talk to you about what you saw. Be our, be our uh, person on the scene. Uh, give, us a, give us the inside scoop. All right, well, that's all the comics news, so let's move on to our 
comic review? Oh, wait, no. <laughs> no IDW comic, uh, Transformers comic this week. So we're going to do something a little bit different. And we are going to do a cartoon review. So we are going to talk about the second half of the Transformers Cyberverse cartoon. Uh, so I think last time we talked about uh, the the episode uh, it was episode 10 McAdams where we you know we loved all the IDW references that were in that uh, so we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, the I guess the back half of the season um, Daryl I'm gonna throw it to you uh, to help lead us through this discussion here and mm-hmm. you know let, let's uh, I guess what did you think overall of the of the Cyberverse series uh, well uh, I'm really liking it. I remember watching the first two episodes back to back and thinking, this is not going to be any good. Mm-hmm. But by the time we got to the latter half of that first 10, uh, I was really into it. As far as this last eight episodes go, so from 11 till 18, it uh it was the same as the first or the last five from the first 10. It was great stuff. This, uh, these writers are pulling from the IDW, the, the old, uh, the old storylines, um, introducing stuff that, uh, has like really deep mythology and character driven stuff. That's really fun, but also it's building Bumblebee's memories and putting them in, in kind of this weird order where he's trying to fit together what's happened to him, but also showing the audience that this war has started that he's been a part of, but kind of how it started and putting pieces together. I've really liked watching that. Mm -hmm. What about you guys? We've got uh, eight episodes to kind of go through here, 11 minutes each. Um, So that's a lot of, a lot of time. Let's let's start. I mean, episode eleven is called Sabotage. Sabotage. This is the episode where Shockwave traps Bumblebee in a false memory, um, and it's supposed to kind of bring him over to the Decepticon side. You want to talk about this one for a bit? Do you remember it? Yeah, I mean, I I, I did uh, I did a rewatch today, so I, I you know I put it put a YouTube playlist and and just watched them back to back. Um, and I, I, I took a few notes just as I, to, to remind me of, of little bits I wanted to, to mention, but the, yeah, the sabotage episode, it was, it was fun. Uh, one thing that in, when they, they give B, uh, Bumblebee's false memories. And the one thing that really stuck out to me was the, uh, they had a cameo of Rack and Ruin, who is a very obscure character. He's a, a G1 wrecker from the UK comics that has not really been shown or mentioned in very many places. Uh, he's a, you know, he's a weird character cause he's, he's basically a, a Siamese twin bot or conjoined twin bot, mm-hmm. which uh, we don't see a lot of in, in transformers. And this, I think this would be his like first appearance in a, a you know, a TV or a animated show. Yeah. So I would say so. Yeah. I thought that was that was interesting, and then just the general um, the general memory I thought Shockwave had created was funny because not only does he make Bumblebee like a Decepticon traitor, then at the end you have the further twist that yeah, Optimus Prime, leader of the Autobots, he is also a Decepticon traitor working with Bumblebee, and they will <laughs> overthrow the Autobots together, uh, which kind of like. Okay, Shockwave, you just went a little too far. <laughs> you could have made yeah. it a little bit more plausible. <laughs> yeah, he he always had it. He just had to do that little extra tweak. Yeah, it it, it reminds me of um, in The Simpsons when when Bart tries to fake his report card grades and he tries to turn all his D minuses into A pluses. And uh, when Homer <laughs> looks at the report card, he says, "Come on, boy, a D turns into a B so easily. You just got greedy." <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Jeremy, did you have anything to mention about this this episode? I mean, I I um, really enjoyed it as well. I do. I, I like the the conceit of this episode with the, the fake memory. It's just it it was it was fun, kind of just seeing what you know is a fake memory. But you know, 
it just he, he's going through this buying it and then the optimus prime reveal happens and that's enough to shake him out of it mm-hmm. so yeah it's um it was fun all right well let's move on to episode 12 this is called teletra should maybe i should mention it or call it teletran x that is the proper spelling <laughs> Um, okay, I, I did. I did notice. I think only it seems like only the Optimus Prime voice actor has a problem with the Teletran Teletron thing. Everyone else seems to yeah. say Teletran correctly. Mm-hmm. It's just the Optimus Prime voice actor who's who's having a, having some trouble there. Yeah, and I think he said it twice. Yeah. yeah, it's only been done twice. Okay, so this one's called Teletran X or Teletron X. Uh, it's. Windblade and Bumblebee trace an Autobot signal to find themselves and find themselves lured into a trap set by Slipstream and her Seekers. Um, for me, the ongoing uh, kind of you know battle between Slipstream and Windblade has been you know great fun through this uh, through this thing. Will Slipstream get the best of Bum- or uh, Windblade uh, at some point? At one point, she does. Uh, but then it gets screwed up. Yeah, it's uh, it's been fun to watch because, you know, it's not a, a foregone conclusion that Windblade's going to get away or, you know, beat uh, beat Slipstream because, you know, they're both fairly evenly matched. Um, but uh, what, uh, Charles, what do you think? Uh, what do you remember of Teletran X? I just, I like the, the Teletran X drone character. I, I thought he was a, like, he's a fun comic relief for the rest of the series. And, his continual not crew, not crew uh, catchphrase was, mm-hmm. I, I enjoyed it. I thought uh, it was, I mean, and also like when they first find him, they're like, you know, he's like, they they ask him, you know, can we, can you help us? He's like, well, not right now. Cause I'm a trap. <laughs> and then the Decepticons come out and it's like, <laughs> but he, but he's like, he's so good natured. And he's like, oh, well, you know, I want that. He's still helping the Autobots. Cause he's like, I didn't really want to be a trap, but they, you know, they used me. <laughs> And then he's then he actually starts helping them. So mm-hmm. he's he's been a fun character. And then uh, you know he he has a he has a big moment at the very end of the last yeah. episode. He mm-hmm. started out really annoying to me. I yeah, mean, it got better towards the end. But at the big when during this introduction, I was just like, oh, I'm really not going to like this character. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, he's he's the R two D two or the. What was the one from the last step, the last series? GB8. No, 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 not not Star Wars. <laughs> but the, <laughs> for this, the 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 one from uh, the the RID 2005. Oh, oh, I uh, uh, no, it's not, it, I'm thinking glitch, but it's fix it. It's not glitch. Fix it. Yes, it's it's the fix it character. That's that's who Teletran X is. He's he's the fix it fig, uh, character for this show. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, and and the they do a good job with him. He's fun. Let's move on to episode thirteen. This one's called Matrix of Leadership. This is a big one. Bumblebee learns the meaning of the leadership through three memories of Optimus Prime. Um, so this one here, uh, I just remember him him kind of sitting in his memory ball and just kind of looking at different memories of Optimus Prime. Honestly, I cannot remember the specific memories. Charles, you watched it today. I'm going to mm-hmm. kind of rest on you to remind me of them. But uh, this kind of solidified him as you know, Bumblebee as, yeah, I know I'm, I know what side I'm on and I, I need to find Optimus Prime. I hope to find Optimus Prime. Uh, what are your thoughts, Charles? Yeah, so I mean, this they actually have the scene where Optimus gets the Matrix and the way they do it here is... They have Alpha Trion. So Alpha Trion is one of the the senators, uh, and he's been wounded uh, after you know battle with the Decepticons at some point. When the Decepticons, I guess, uh, you know, as as they usually do when they have the uprising and a lot of continuities, the Decepticons have like murdered the the current governments. And Alpha Trion was one of the the council members. He's on his he's basically on his last breath. But he's still got the ma- like he's got the matrix. He's been keeping the matrix safe, waiting for a bot to assume the next the, the next bot to assume the mantle of prime. And 
Optimus. Well, they 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 don't call him by name, so you can I guess you can assume at this point he's still Orion Pax, but they don't really say that in the explicitly on the show. But uh, B basically brings brings Orion to Alpha Trion, and Alpha Trion bestows the Matrix on him, and he becomes Optimus Prime. And you know he says, "I'm not worthy, Alpha Trion, and Alpha Trion. I'm not worthy. I'm not ready." But Alpha Trion says, "No, you're the one." Um, Another memory you is got the touch starts playing. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. uh, another memory that's that's fun is that they uh, like Prime and Bumblebee are are fleeing some seekers being chased by Starscream, and Starscream actually has a sonic scream power that he unleashes. But then you know Prime fights back, and I guess it, these are gimmicks from the toy because Prime fights back with his like Autobot shield on when he turns into truck mode. And, you know, just shows his some more badassery when he's fighting the Seekers. Yeah, I, I like the Sonic Scream attack. That was nice. Yeah. And uh, and then another memory is uh, Bumblebee, Bumblebee and Wheeljack are, are fleeing Decepticons trying to get back there uh, behind Autobot lines, which I thought was a nice callback to the, the first G1 episode, because that's where you see Bumblebee and Wheeljack as a team. Uh, mm-hmm. and as they're escaping, they're like, they left Prowl behind. They're like, how we need to go back for Prowl, but you know, they're really pinned down. And so the, but then they see in the distance that they got back up because Optimus Prime is carrying Prowl, uh, by himself back, you know, be, uh, to, to safety. So, you know, just shows another hero moment for Optimus Prime, how he never leaves a bot behind. So. You know, mm-hmm. all all suitably heroic moments for Optimus Prime, and this inspires Bumblebee to go back and rescue Windblade because Windblade was captured in the last episode, and she basically bought Bumblebee and Teletran X time to escape uh, because you know B wanted to use Teletran X to find the location of the Ark. Uh, of course, Teltran X says, oh, I don't actually know where the Ark is. <laughs> so then Bumblebee decides, yeah, they need to go back and rescue Windblade. Jeremy, did you have anything to add to that? Just, I, I like the tweaks on the whole, um, you know, traditional Matrix stuff where I mean, we, we get basically what was in the 86 movie between Optimus and Ultra Magnus between mm-hmm. Alpha Trion and Optimus here. It, I, I like how the the planet is dying because Optimus made a mistake and injected the Spark. You know, th- this is not an infallible character and I, I like that and uh it really kind of gives i don't know i mean we you know we saw the whole ejecting of the all spark in the live action movies and I can't remember if they did that in transformers prime or not but i i like seeing that it it is a bad decision and there are catastrophic effects because of it and um you know the arc is literally like an arc trying to save the race with like however many people get on it these episodes like each one i'm i'm enjoying better than the last as we go on all right well let's move on to episode 14 this one's called siloed and this one uh amongst others this one is also written by Margaret scott so that's important to know because we know her from writing our favorite uh one of our favorites till all our one book and she worked on Transformers Prime. She worked on a little bit on R.I.D. and she is now currently writing Batgirl. So there you go. But uh, in Siloed, the Seekers attempt to extract the location of the Ark from Windblade's memories. So the Seekers are not smart, uh, and that's fine. I I don't uh, I don't dislike that about them. I think that's a great little tidbit to throw in there that the seekers except for a, a a few like slipstream and probably starscream um but the you know the kind of unnamed the file se- yeah the rank and file ones they're just dumb and, and that's perfectly fine you know so this one here you know i alluded to it before a couple episodes ago uh, slipstream did in the last episode finally get the best of windblade and they captured her um, and so now they're trying to get the uh, memories of the Ark out of her head, but she doesn't know them. So it's uh, it's a good episode, and uh, I just I remember you know uh, because they Bumblebee and you know he needs to um, go and rescue her, and that's the main plot of this episode. 
Charles. Yeah, I mean, she. This is a very much. A, it's it's appropriate that Margaret Scott writes this episode because it is very much a Windblade focused episode. She and it's funny also. She escapes basically. She pretty much escapes without Bumblebee's help, and he just you know comes in at the last second to to finally pull her up out of the out of the silo. But uh, for the most part, she gets out on her own. They, they open the last door. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I did like the seeker, the whole seeker hierarchy. Um, also, I think I think it's interesting that in in this show, you have it seems like a majority of the seekers, at least on Earth, are female. Like you have you have Slipstream, you have Nova Storm, you have Acid Storm. They're all female seekers, and the only real like regular male seekers you see are Thundercracker and Thrust and. Th- Thrust is not a conehead, sadly. I guess they, they couldn't spare for the extra animation model for the conehead design. But uh, I, I just think that was uh, it was interesting to see that. Um, Shockwave, I like Shockwave having perpetual angry eye. I think that's, a, that's an interesting wrinkle to add to him. And him being very dismissive of the Seekers and their intelligence was a, you know, a nice little detail. Okay, and Jeremy, did you uh, want to throw something in there? Yeah, I mean, I I like how there's, like, the reveal towards the end of this where uh, Slipstream has to report in about, like, what they have found and being frustrated that uh, Windblade's not providing any information. She cranks up the, the psychic patch thing as far as it'll go, and that's ultimately the downfall because, like, whatever happens, Windblade's able to use that to kind of do a blast that knocks out the um, seekers guarding her, but also slipstream has to go and report in and it's not just star screen. We get shockwave as well. It's, it's an interesting shockwave we see here. Star scream is star scream and stuff, but shockwave is very, I don't know, calculating. And I don't know. It's, I really like their take on shockwave here. Mm-hmm. Windblade is, is done very well. And I really like that they have Marigred do this episode. All right, so we'll move on to episode 15. This one's called King of Dinosaurs, uh, King of the Dinosaurs, and this one should be kind of self-explanatory, but uh, the description is Windblade and Bumblebee uncover a buried Autobot who turns out to be an old friend. So that combined with the name should help you out. And if you've been watching the show up until now, you can put two and two together. <laughs> the old friend and the king of dinosaurs is Grimlock. So, what? <laughs> <laughs> spoilers. <laughs> um, yeah, it's uh, and and this. I mean, we've seen Grimlock before because he was in some flashbacks. Uh, I like the characterization of Grimlock. He's mm-hmm. we we get him in a different mode in the first appearance because I don't think he can transform out of his his dinosaur mode uh, until the very end and in his dinosaur mode he is just enraged and they can't control him so he's an interesting character when he transforms because back once he gets back into robot mode he's fine but uh, once he's in dinosaur mode he's 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 uncontrollable I think this is something that they took from the comics where I don't know if they're doing it the same way here, but in the comics, wasn't it where like in robot mode, there was like pressure putting put on his brain module that kind of right. dumbed him down mm-hmm. and here. It might be like a power thing, but mm-hmm. similar aspect. I think also it was in the, um, the war for Cybertron or follow Cybertron uh-huh. game yeah. where, uh, Shock as a result of Shockwave's experiments on the Dinobots, they were like rage monsters in dinosaur mode, uh, and mm-hmm. like uh, you know, regular in robot mode. But yeah, I mean, it's the Incredible Hulk that's who he is. The Incredible Hulk, yeah, Dr. Jekyll, much. and and Mr. Hyde, yes. you know, all that good stuff. But we were all concerned when they first introduced Grimlock, and he's just like proper speaking character, and we're like, what you know, have they done? Yeah, <laughs> to our to our Grimlock. But yeah. This is a nice mix of the two. Mm-hmm. Yep. And the, the one, Charles, do you want to expand? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So the one, this, this is the one thing that kind of bothers me because they've like blown the time scale out beyond all proportion. Like 
it's already kind of a stretch in the in G1 when they crash land on Earth four million years ago. I mean, that's already a really long time. Now they crash on Earth 65 million years ago. And all the other Transformers have just been running around for 65 million years, still at war. And still, I mean, everyone should be dust after 65 million years. I don't care if you're a robot that, you know, has a really long lifespan. You're not surviving for 65 million years in perpetual war. I mean, that just seems well, And and the ship is not going to not be discovered. Yeah. It's just a really, really, really long time. But uh, other than I mean I can I can basically suspend my disbelief for that. But other than that, it, it, everything was fine. I, I thought it was funny that Grimlock like basically he literally became king of the dinosaurs, and the dinosaurs were actually helping him like build or, build <laughs> the ark and everything. I want the, also I, the little bit of comedy when he's when he's woken up to try and save the ark, and the ark's like. Uh, Teletran One is like, okay, uh, Grimlock, go to go to my main console to help save your crew, and then he gets throw immediately gets thrown out of the air out of, out of uh, the hull, and Teletran One's like, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I, that that little bit of comedy interjected in, into the um, into the episode was fun, and yeah, Grimlock's Grimlock's a fun character here. Do you have anything else you wanted to add, Jeremy? No, I think um, said everything already. It- this fun episode. Yeah, it is. Uh, okay, S- episode 16 is called The Extinction Event. And this one is its uh, description. The newly formed team of Autobots must stop Shockwave from destroying all life on the planet. So this one I don't remember too much about. I do believe it's more of a flashback uh, than anything. No, but no, it's it's okay. all. Then I don't remember it at all. But yeah, go ahead, Charles. Tell us what this one's about. <laughs> so basically, like the the last few episodes, like with all the Decepticons have been waiting for Shockwave to arrive, and Shockwave basically, uh, he in the uh, like I think the the pre the the episode. Uh, the siloed episode, he tells Slipstream, "Okay, I'm going to send you instructions to repair the space bridge in orbit around Earth." And I guess you know, off screen, they did that. So then the space bridge opens, and Shockwave's ship comes through. And Shockwave's like, "Okay, you guys have been screwing up royally this whole time. So now I'm going to take charge." And the easiest way to basically locate the Autobots and take care of them is to basically eliminate all organic life on the planet. And then we'll, you know, we'll have no obstructions to destroy the Autobots. So, so Shockwave's, you know, not wasting any time. He's like, let's just, let's just nuke it I mean, from he, orbit. He, he's not wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, so he's got some, uh, he's got like two giant mega ships. He's going to send them to both poles of the planet and then they'll disrupt the magnetic fil- field of the planet and that should kill everything. And so the Autobots detect this but they figure out okay we don't need to destroy both ships we just need to destroy one to to stop shockwave's plan and they do that um you know but they basically it's the three autobots versus all of the seekers and uh shadow striker who is basically shockwave's henchman hench henchwoman and then and shockwave so they win but shockwave has a little drone baby that sneaks aboard the um the autobots ship so like he's he's basically got got someone spying on the autobots as they are continuing Mm -hmm. to search for the ark so his plan was foiled but he's got a backup plan because really all he cares about is getting to the ark and destroying either finding the all spark and or destroying the autobots so that sets us up for the next episode uh jeremy yeah this is i mean it's shocking to see that there's actually a Decepticon with a good plan, but I mean, it's Shockwave. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, this was just really nice to see, like, real stakes here. Although I'm surprised that we don't see any, like, defenses trying to attack them. That's true. I mean, the most humans we've seen was just the, you know, distance. In the last episode, there was, like, a city in the distance. But when they actually go into the city, there's no one there. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think, you know, the whole Earth's um, field thing, It it's a, a nice, I mean, kind of cliched, but nice uh, gimmick here. And, you know, I, I like the the way they had to, to go and try to destroy it. Mm-hmm. 
All right, well, let's move on to episode 17. This one's called Awaken Sleeping Giants. And this one is the Autobot team finally discovers the location of the Ark. Finally. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, really, this is episode 17. They've been looking for it since episode one. You know, a lot of cartoons or shows might have them found it by the end of episode one. So, I mean, here there are 11 minute episodes. So we're really at the end or the beginning of episode nine of a full length episode, episodic TV. So that's a long time. This one here, I think this was basically Grimlock just taking them to it. Uh, He had it all along, but uh, he, I don't from what I recall, he had to remember how to like open it. Mm-hmm. Well, they had they had yeah. the so since since Grimlock was on Earth sixty five million years ago, all the land masses were one land mass. So right. now that they are all split apart, they couldn't figure out where the location was, and then Teletran X like used his you know computer calculations to figure out. Oh, this is where the arc yeah. is. Mm-hmm. It's like if it was, it was here, and it's now over here. Yeah. And I got to give him props for that because uh, this is a kid's cartoon. Mm -hmm. Props for education here. (laughs) (laughs) You know, throwing a little supercontinent into into it. Yep. But what stuck out to you in the episode here, Charles? Well, I mean, the big thing is the arc, the location of the arc is Mount St. Hillary, which is the mountain that the volcano that was named in uh, the original G1 comic. Uh, of course, based on the real uh, volcano, Mount St. Helens, which I think is in Oregon or Washington. Washington uh, State, I think. Yeah. So uh, so nice callback there. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's a pretty, you know, straightforward episode. The Autobots find the location. Shockwave's got his drone spying on them. So they got the location. So it's a race to the Ark. Uh, and, you know, it's a, you know, basically a bit of a fight around the arc and then uh you know finally uh the next episode is is the the final confrontation so pretty straightforward but you know still mm-hmm. fun jeremy what do you remember of it the mount st hillary thing was awesome that was really good we get to see a fastball special which yes you know, <laughs> true. Uh, i think grimlock threw bumblebee it's i i love that you know in in g1 and in most places we see this it's the spaceship is sticking out of the mountain and here it's more in like the belly of the volcano is where the, the ship is. So yeah, it's completely hidden, but why hasn't the volcano completely destroyed it by now? (laughs) But I mean, still, like you said earlier, suspension of disbelief, it is great that, you know, it's pretty, you know, straightforward, you know, A, B, C, get to the, the, End result, but I mean, this is the next to last episode. I, I love the the fact that we have like a hidden drone spy from Shockwave. So you know they're making it believable as to how the Decepticons find out. You know, like you said with the whole you know supercontinent thing, the writing is actually pretty smart in how they're doing some things here. And I love the Shockwave drones look like the little bitty spidery Shockwave we've been getting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this this was a great episode. Then that brings us to the last episode, uh, number 18, Eruption. Autobot team must fight its way through Shockwave and his Decepticons to defend the Ark and awaken Optimus Prime and the other Autobots. Uh, from what I recall of this episode, they are only able to awaken one, and it's Optimus Prime. No, they, they awaken everybody at the very oh, end. Yeah. Then I have no idea what happened, <laughs> uh, because it has been a while since I've seen these. Um, I was supposed to watch them all this weekend, and I got busy. <laughs> you, you were excused. You got some pretty good interviews. So, Charles, tell me what happened in this episode that I don't remember at all. Yeah, so, I mean, it's it's the continued, continuing battle between the Autobots and uh, the Decepticons. Uh, the Autobots being Bumblebee, Grimlock, and Windblade. Uh, 
uh, Bumblebee and Teletran X get into the Ark, and Teletran X basically uploads. Uh, you know, he finds that the the Teletran One is basically deactivated, but he can reboot Teletran One by uploading himself in since he is a backup copy of Teletran One, uh, and he does that. Um, he gets shot. Uh, as he's in mid upload, so Bumblebee thinks he's dead, but it's he succeeded, and uh, Teletran X is now the Ark, and so Teletran X basically he has a little bit of uh, growing pains figuring out all the all his internal systems, but he does manage to uh, activate the Ark's uh, weapons to fight off the Decepticons, uh, but uh, Shockwave has his ship in orbit basically heating up the volcano to make it uh, erupt, which will destroy the Ark, but at the last second Teletran X uh, activates the shields, so the Ark is saved. And in the meantime, he activates the uh, re, uh, reanimation um, uh, protocol to activate all the other Autobots. So uh, the last scene of the episode is, uh, so after the eruption the arc, the engines of the arc are exposed at the bottom of the volcano, just like in G1, and uh, and all the Autobots come out. Uh, they're awakened now. They're ready to fight. And Teltran X is like, "Oh, it's good that you're all awake because there's a Decepticon armada here ready to attack." So Starscream has brought, he's brought all the Decepticons uh, to. Uh, to attack, and so the last line is Optimus Prime saying, Autobots, roll out, and that is the end of the first season. So it's all a big prologue for the real show, which I guess will be later this year. Mm -hmm. And as far as that goes, we know that uh, the most recent news is that Chapter 2 is going to be called Power of the Spark, and it's planned on being released in the fourth quarter of 2019, so this year. So look for it at the end of the year. But overall, I, my opinions on the last half of the season, uh, I think were fantastic. Really great pacing. Uh, they didn't spend a lot of time on like kind of BS, kind of jokey things. Not that I expected Transformers Prime like level darkness out mm -hmm. of this, but it was fun. I watched every episode with my daughter and she loved it. When she asked me a question, I was able to answer it because I knew the backstory of the characters and the, a lot of the stuff. I mean, going back to episode 10, McAdam, I had no idea who that was, so I couldn't answer that. But I, we, we researched it together and we figured it out. So, yeah. And I actually really liked the, uh, the, the kind of the storyline that Shadow Striker took. Mm -hmm. Kind very of. Very interesting new character. Very interesting. And how she just cannot catch a break mm -hmm. and it's it's almost sad but she brings it on herself it's kind of like nebula from guardians of the galaxy yes in, i think like, that's a very good comparison yeah with particularly the body replacements and stuff yeah uh all in all you guys uh what do you feel charles yeah i, I was really digging this show uh by the end i, I enjoyed it the only the only complaint that i would have is it's it's you can't do one episode a week. I mean, I I know you guys in Canada got probably got two and two a week. They need to just yes. they need to show two two a week here. I mean, fifteen minutes is just too short. I mean, and then they mm -hmm. they don't even um like rerun them at all during the uh, on Cartoon Network. But I guess they're on YouTube, so I guess it doesn't yeah. matter. <laughs> at least they're doing that. Yeah. Are you guys not getting re uh, reruns right now? You can watch it on demand. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we were getting reruns right now too. I guess I guess in the in in an on demand world, reruns are not as significant. But I mean, um, I really like that Hasbro's just putting them on YouTube. That's, yeah. I mean, well, it makes no difference to anyone outside of can or outside of the U.S. Though. Yeah, they huh. need to they need to unregion lock them. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But it's good for Especially me and Jeremy for the <laughs> for the for the the show that's made in Ireland. Right. Maybe let the Irish people watch it too. <laughs> And today being, you know, for the next two minutes, it's St. Patrick's Day. We're all a little Irish. I still got an hour. <laughs> well, in Ireland, it's no longer St. Patrick's Day yeah. at this point. <laughs> Every day is St. Patrick's Day in Ireland. Yeah, so that's it for the comic book review. <laughs> I'll send it back to you, Charles. All right, well, uh, Daryl, I'm going to turn the table right back around because we're going into Transformers Media News. 
All right, in media news this week, we've got the uh, new starter set that's being uh, been announced. It's the Bumblebee versus Megatron set. Doesn't seem too fair to me. It's a new uh, it's a new set with uh, new cards. There looks to be a Windblade card in it and a Starscream card in it uh, as well. And you also get a new 40, uh, 40 battle cards for a uh, game deck. So there you go. That's kind of fun. If you wanted something a little different, yeah, look to pick that up. Uh, Bumblebee the movie news. Uh, Wilson X. Uh, Bumblebee basketball leather balls. Wow. This is a little much. So we've got yellow and black balls uh, for Bumblebee the movie. They're basketballs. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Still, it's a little it's a little too much. But yeah, no, it's uh, that's that's fine, I guess. Um, we've got uh, Haley Steinfeld in Japan uh, doing some press for the Bumblebee movie being uh, its release in uh, in Japan. Um, I don't know. Well, I mean, it looks like it's her and her voice actor who's uh, doing the voice, so that's kind of fun. Um, but yeah, take a look at that if you're uh, if you're interested. Um, also, we've got. Uh, Bumblebee the movie DVD plus Blu-ray combo pack with free digital copy of Transformers 2007. Why? So, yeah, you can get that now, too, if you want. Future movies. Here we go. All right. Future of Transformers movies. Beast Wars live action movie remains undecided. Um, With with one of uh, the beginning of a number of quotes from Lorenzo Di Bonaventura. How oh, many people guy. know Beast Wars? I know Lorenzo Di Bonaventura does, because he is the producer. He knows everything about Transformers. Mm, clearly, he has <laughs> he has the l- l- the Lorenzo Di Bonaventura cast, and <laughs> it's all about Transformers. Yeah. Well, let's just say we'll have more choice quotes from him coming up. I mean, so my my one uh, so he mentions like the. He he says, well, the live action Beast Wars movie would cost four hundred fifty million dollars to make. I mean, that's crazy because you'd need to make one point one two five billion dollars to break even. But the question I have is, why would you make a live action Beast Wars movie? That makes no sense. I mean, I know I know Disney's making a live action, quote unquote, live action Lion King movie. That's. That's also that's equally still animated. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's that's what I mean. I mean a, a Beast Wars movie, just make it an animated movie. Why would you? Why would you want to make it photorealistic live action? Look at there the are... success of Spider Verse. You can yeah make a a blockbuster animated movie. So I mean the he no, Marvel he... can. Lorenzo <laughs> de Bonaventura cannot. Apparently, he not. knows he needs to make one point two one point one two five billion. Uh, with whatever movie he needs to make to break even. That's, mm. And he can't do that unless <laughs> Michael Bay is there. Mm. And he's not going to do it with them silly cartoon. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, yeah, I mean, first of all, just don't do a live-action Beast Wars movie. Just do a Beast Wars movie without any humans. Make it all animated. That's uh, that's all you need to do. And it doesn't. it won't cost $450 million. You know what? Just take... The agenda episodes reanimate it with modern animation and just put that out as a single feature. I mean, I mean, don't even say it's a new thing. Just say, hey, this is an updated HD version of this awesome arc. Mm-hmm. Much cheaper, and you will make bank on it. One point one two five billion. Well, not <laughs> not that, but I mean, that's just to reach the break even value of the four hundred fifty million. But that's one point one two five billion bank. Well, <laughs> but I mean, you know, the the five people that know Beast Wars would go and love it. Uh, next topic here: the Optimus Prime solo movie has been halted. More information on Bumblebee two, according to the all-knowing Lorenzo Di Bonaventura. Uh, doing a solo Optimus m- movie would be like making a solo Obi Wan Kenobi movie. It can't be done. Okay, yeah, I mean, your most recognizable character that everyone loves, you can't make a movie centered around him. Okay, um, 
I guess if that's what you, I mean, maybe, maybe this is not the right franchise for you. If that's, if that's your feeling. Yeah. As I said on Twitter, when I saw this news, thinking that an Obi-Wan Kenobi movie cannot be done is showing that you have zero vision or creativity at all. I mean, there are a number of books in the star Wars, uh, now, you know, legends universe or whatever, um, about Obi-Wan Kenobi on Tatooine. There have been rumors like an Obi-Wan Kenobi movie has been in production for years. There's, you know, I believe there's rumors that a story has been done. It's just Lucasfilm with like the fate of solo. You know, a lot of these movies have been shelved. The actor, uh, Ewan McGregor has said he would love to come back and play the character. You can make an Obi-Wan Kenobi movie dealing with, you know, all the scum and villainy that you find on Tatooine, the huts. I mean, and the original movie, he was referred to as that old wizard. So obviously some stuff has gone down. He has a reputation on Tatooine. So saying you can't do the same with Optimus Prime is you have no original thought in your head, Mr. B- Lorenzo D. Bonaventura. Damn. <laughs> this pissed me off. Charles, would you like to... Uh... Lay a verbal smack down as well. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I, I just, I, I don't, I, I don't think I can do anything better than Jeremy here. I mean, I, I, I wholeheartedly co-sign and agree with that. I mean, I, I don't understand. I mean, it's, I mean, I think it's even, it's, it's a worse comparison because, like, Optimus Prime, like Obi Wan Kenobi is important to Star Wars, but Optimus mm-hmm. Prime is like the heart of Transformers. That's the right. character. That's the go-to character that they always make a toy first that but all the kids love. Saying, yeah, it's more saying I can't make a Luke Skywalker movie. Yeah, <laughs> that's where Optimus Prime is in the you know Transformers. So I, I just don't understand that. I mean, I mean, well, there's I'm still a- more here, guys. You go ahead. You want to finish your 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 rant? Go go ahead. No, I'm just saying. I, I mean, I like Bumblebee is fine, but I, Bumblebee for me is not the main character of Transformers. I don't want everything centered around oh, Bumblebee. <laughs> Oh, you got me, Jeremy. (laughs) So we've got more information regarding the future of the Transformers movie franchise 2019 and beyond. This one is, uh, this information was also brought to us by the man behind the curtain, Lorenzo Di Bonaventura. He has stated that one of the latest in the main family series following the events of the Transformers The Last Night and other is a sequel to Bumblebee. (laughs) Yeah. So, while not much is revealed for the Transformers The Last Night sequel, the Bumblebee one, however, is a buddy movie featuring Optimus Prime and Bumblebee as the main protagonists. Optimus Prime is not a buddy to anyone. He's a commanding officer. Bumblebee is the buddy. (laughs) <laughs> Bumblebee's the buddy. This I mean, is in, in the other article. It said this is kind of like a lethal weapon thing with Optimus Prime playing was Danny the Glover. Murtog, Murtog yeah. character, Ugh. and Bumblebee is the Riggs. Oh, oh, it's ridiculous! I mean, okay, Optimus Prime saying I don't have time for this shit. Yeah, I mean that'd be that'd fit the Bavers. <laughs> yeah. But the Optimus Prime we saw in Bumblebee is more of the classic. He's a commander, yeah. Yeah, he's not a murderer. (laughs) (laughs) I see this as the Bumblebee movie did well enough to make some money, and De Bonaventura has the idea now, I can finish my last night uh, sequel and get this story told. No, (laughs) don't do it. (laughs) No no one liked the last night. Don't, Don't do a sequel to the last night. I mean, okay, the the Optimus Prime Bumblebee movie, we figured Optimus Prime was going to play into the Bumblebee sequel at, after the ending of that movie. Fine, that, you know, if it had the heart of the Bumblebee movie, totally okay with it. The last night thing, no. Or a, as Mr. LeBouf says. No, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, I just don't understand this because one thing, they already said that the Bumblebee movie is a quote-unquote reboot. So why are you going to, you're just confusing audiences if you're bringing back a sequel yeah. to the last night and 
there is no audience for a last night sequel. <laughs> Did you see the box office returns for the last night? No one wants the last a Remember, sequel to the last night. <laughs> De Bonaventura doesn't know the meaning of the word sequel or reboot. He's yeah, you know, he, he was also it. quoted somewhere else. Uh, I read that he has been hearing from the fandom and he wants, you know, th- they liked Bumblebee and all, but they needed a little bit more Bayhem. No, no, where did to he hear which that? I say, <laughs> no, screw you, Mr. Lorenzo Di Bonaventura. You know who is the fault of this? This is Eric Crownover's fault. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Shut up, Eric. <laughs> you're, you're killing this for us. I don't know. I think there's going to be some bad decisions made here. Mm-hmm. Somebody needs to get Di Bonaventura out of the seat he's in. We We just need... Disney to buy Paramount and <laughs> oh my god and then you know they can kick him out and all right well that ends the uh very you know positively spun media news segment this week all right <laughs> <laughs> well uh let's finish up the show with some feedback All right, uh, so we had some Discord feedback from Skirt, one of our Donatrions, and uh, they ask, uh, prediction slash bets on where the new IDW Transformers narrative will head after reading issue one and having talked to Ruckley, Brian Ruckley, the writer, or hopes on what direction it might go, given what you know now. So, um, I mean, I don't, I don't really have a. I mean, I think we're gonna go towards a civil war. <laughs> that's probably, mm-hmm. that's probably pretty obvious. Um, I'm, I'm, cu- I'm curious where, like, how the Decepticons will rise from the Ascenticons. That's my current. Like, I'm curious what Megatron's grievances are in this new universe because it doesn't seem like. Uh, there's really much wrong on Cybertron at this point. I mean, Cybertron doesn't, it doesn't seem like, like in the old IDW continuity, there was like clearly, uh, like a caste system on Cybertron mm-hmm. and, and there was an oppressed min- or minority or oppressed majority, uh, who were, you know, getting, getting really, um, persecuted and, and, uh, downtrodden by the, by the elite. But here, at least from what we we've glimpsed in this first issue, it doesn't seem like that yeah, is much of really an issue. We don't have that information yet. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. So. Yeah. So I, I I'm curious what the uh what what the grievances are that that turns Megatron down the path that he will eventually take. Um. But I think I mean I, I think the destination is pretty well understood i mean we're going towards a civil war but uh, i am curious like i also curious like how orion like what what the path of orion pax going to becoming optimus prime is here what if the the whole prime idea is still carried forward here if the matrix is still an issue here and like what what that all entails um uh, I'm also curious what the like what the main cast is going to be. Like we haven't seen too many bots so far, but at least it looks like Chromia and Prowl are going to be like you know the beat cops investigating the murder. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. So I don't, I don't know. I, I'm I'm just I'm I'm looking forward to it, but I'm not. I don't have any any firm predictions, and I I just hope it's a it's a good story. I hope it's a you know. A compelling story and the the characters get the the focus that they deserve so that's it daryl what are your thoughts i think we're just we're gonna get a straight up kind of journey to to the war the death is gonna ignite a, a a debate on who did it one side is gonna get really really upset with the accusations and they're going to snap I think it's going to be pretty simple. Mm-hmm. There might be some uh, political like influence, I guess. You know, so, uh, somebody trying to uh, keep the uh, keep the the voices down while they, you know, they they move the the dialogue forward, and they don't want to be kept down, so they rebel, and the war starts. 
I've seen it a thousand times. It happens. <laughs> it's the way it happens every single time. Every time, uh, you know, a government pushes pushes back on a downtrodden uh, civil war. Every time. Without <laughs> fail. <laughs> All right, and Jeremy, uh, what, what do you do? You have any uh, thoughts or predictions? I'm just waiting for them to get to Earth. <laughs> you know, the humans are the most important characters. <laughs> no, I, I honestly, I I'm just expecting a slow build, at least until we get to maybe issue four, I, and it helps with the the every two week thing. Assuming Diamond actually does it, the I really want to kind of understand the world we're in before action really starts, you know, picking up. But I, I would say probably issue four or five, I'm expecting, you know, the sparks to be igniting on the, you know, the conflict in, you know, in earnest. I want to see, you know, why is Optimus the only one we've seen with not about logo? And, you mm-hmm. know, when do the other people kind of choose their factions. That, that'll be interesting. The The world, they they mention, I don't know if it was in the interview or in the the book itself, but it mentions that there is an intergalactic um, community and Cybertron is a part of it. So it's not like the previous one where they're basically ostracized because they can't stop, you know, blowing things up. And we saw aliens on Cybertron and there are more aliens. I want to see how that works. And is there kind of an intergalactic, you know, uh, police force type? We, we saw it with like Ultra Magnus and stuff in the previous, you know, I'm just I'm curious as to how all that works. And honestly, I really do like that. We're getting all of this stuff. We are still way before anything involving Earth. Nothing that's awesome. So, yeah, I I just. I'm I'm I really dug issue one. I'm looking forward to um, just the world building that we're going to get. All right. That's it for feedback. So I think that brings us to the end of the episode. That's it for alt mode this week. So thanks everyone for listening and we will see you next time. Bye bye. Bye. Later. Hey everyone. Thanks for listening to this episode of transmissions, but just because this episode is over doesn't mean the transformers fun has to stop. Join us and other Transformers fans on our Discord chat server by visiting transmissionspodcast.com slash Discord. If you would like to learn more about how you could support the Transmissions Podcast, just visit transmissionspodcast.com slash support. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you again next week. Charles, were you playing Switch? No. (laughs) (laughs) I stopped very at the beginning. I did I put it down. I haven't picked it up again.